principal funding for Rights and Wrongs, the Human Rights Television Series, has been provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Body Shop Foundation, and the Aaron Diamond Foundation. Global Vision presents a new program on the cutting edge of change. This week, El Salvador. We now know the official truth. The UN blames El Salvador's military for most massacres, assassinations, and other human rights abuses. Unarmed civilians were dragged out of their houses in the middle of the night and killed with machetes or shot in the head or brought to an intelligence brigade and tortured to death. December 10th, 1948. Adoption, 48. The United Nations adopts the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A movement is born. Human rights is probably the most conservative idea in the world today. Individuals must be protected from governments. That is not a left-wing idea. It's an American idea. These stories and more as human rights comes to television on Rights and Wrongs, hosted by award-winning journalist Charlene Hunter-Gault. The debate over right and wrong has been with us from the beginning of time. But in our age, some boundaries have been set, codified in law, and in theory at least upheld by governments. But in practice, hundreds of millions of people live without rights that many of us take for granted. The right to speak our minds, to practice our religion, or to elect our representatives. Now, all over the world, the fight for human rights, long a lonely and obscure one, has moved to center stage, and it's making waves and making news. That's why we felt the need for a special TV series to focus special attention on what are often issues of life and death. We'll not only spotlight cruel practices governments try to hide, we will also celebrate the heroism of ordinary people who stand up for justice. Welcome to a new program in an era when human rights is becoming the universal aspiration. I'm Charlene Hunter-Gault, and this is Rights and Wrongs. Rights and Wrongs, Human Rights Television. Focusing on the human rights challenge worldwide. News you don't see elsewhere. Personal profiles in courage. And cultural features that take a stand. See? Human rights advocates are usually people of strong conviction and almost messianic faith. They tend to believe in the rule of law and the promise of democracy in places where often neither exist. They are always brave and often at risk. To launch our series, we've called on some leading voices of human rights who articulate themes of one of the most influential forces of our time, human rights born out of the horror of World War II. Out of the war came a total indignation against all the brutalities and incidents that had taken place and that was behind uh, the great thirst, which everybody felt uh, should be uh, proclaimed as a universal guide for all the peoples of the world. It is not a treaty, it is not an international agreement. It is a declaration of basic principles of human rights and freedoms, and to serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples of all nations. The idea was to have an understanding all around the world about the worth and dignity of the human person. What they managed to do was to find in general words aspirations which would fit for all peoples and perhaps for all times. I realize that unless people are willing to assert these rights, take risks, uh, these rights will continue to be meaningless. It is impossible, you cannot imagine the kind of brutality that, that uh, leaders will unleash 
when they, they're trying to uh, stay in power, I guess, for life. Pressure does work, and uh, there is need to maintain and sustain that pressure until the democratic process is complete. In Guatemala, the Declaration of Human Rights means nothing, absolutely nothing. But it is important for us to know that people outside our country cares for those human rights to be respected because all the peoples of the world belong to each other and we have to take care of each one of those people that are in suffering. When they look around, I'm not sure where they get any inkling that there is any justice somewhere, but they deeply believe that things are supposed to be right and will be right, perhaps not now, perhaps for their children. One of the tragedies of the, of the post-World War II era, the era post-Nuremberg, is that there has almost never been an occasion when the perpetrators of these great crimes against humanity have been called to account for those crimes. I think it is a tremendous opportunity for the international community to say it's not enough to end a war but it is and not enough to stop violating rights. You have to be held accountable. But there needs to be a sense worldwide that there will be a moment of justice. That unless the sense of justice um, can reestablish itself in the world, I think the prospect for a world in which the, uh, the rule of law prevails is simply non-existent. We have to bother about our lives. We have to take risks. My hopes are the hopes of every woman. Equality for women. Equal chances, better lives than the lives we are living now, and freedom. Freedom of choice, freedom of speech, freedom of research, freedom to educate each other. These are my hopes. When the communist governments of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union began to dis disintegrate, it was extraordinarily gratifying not just to see the people we had worked for get freedom, but also to realize that the very work we had done was being factored into the kinds of reforms that were being made, which shows that those governments that seemed not to be listening to a word that we said were, in fact, listening all along. My God, it's working. It could happen and will happen, ultimately, in a lot of other places as well. My name is Chai Ling, and right now I'm a refugee. After the massacre, the government tried to arrest people, put people in the most wanted list, and, you know, execution people. Emotionally, I was very sad, and some of my, part of my emotion felt guilty because I'm survived. My friends, they're still suffering. I think all of our lives are diminished by injustice. I think uh, all of our lives are, are diminished by, by lack of freedom. I think all of our lives are, are diminished when a child slowly dies of, of malnutrition in a world in which there is an abundance of, of, of food. And I think that uh, the, the people who are struggling for these uh, issues are, are my teachers. I'm, I've learned the, the meaning of the word courage and the meaning of the word determination uh, from them. And I think that uh, we, need to, we need to hear their voices and, and see their example uh, and respond to those to give our own lives meaning. You are watching Rights and Wrongs, Human Rights Television. Each week at this time, news and global perspectives you don't see elsewhere. Rights and Wrongs doesn't have an army of correspondents. What we do have is access to the work of independent journalists and human rights monitors with home video cameras. On each program, we'll be sharing highlights of their work on what we call our rights reel. 
This week, we take you first to the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, where Haitian refugees, many of whom have tested HIV positive, have been detained. Haitian-American cameraman Luger Ballon is one source of our footage. When I shot these materials in Guantanamo, I mean, for the most part, I found that the refugees uh, did not believe that they were HIV positive. They didn't, they didn't trust the military medical system there. Uh, they were living in these horrible uh, conditions uh, with very poor medical care. Uh, for the most part, they were very angry, very frustrated. They were detained as if they were prisoners. Uh, a lot of them believe that they are political prisoners and not uh, 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 refugees detained for HIV. In late March, an appeals court ordered military authorities to clean up this camp, which has recently been the scene of inmate rebellions and military crackdowns, including the incarceration of would-be escapees. The fate of all these people remains in the hands of the Clinton administration and the Congress. And what's particularly disturbing about this group of Haitians is that um, but for the intervention of our Coast Guard, they would have been able to come to the shore of Florida. Um, our own immigration service has found that these people, in fact, have credible claims of persecution. This policy deadlock and the plight of the stranded Haitians have provoked loud protest, including civil disobedience and a rally here in New York, where actress Susan Sarandon read a letter from a despairing Haitian mother confined in Guantanamo. It is simply that circumstances have taken me to where I am at this moment. I am sending two pictures so you can look at me for the last time. Goodbye, my children. Goodbye, my family. We will meet again. Non-journalists are also using cameras to document human rights concerns. Israeli producer Ilan Ziv taught some Palestinians living under occupation on the West Bank how to keep video diaries. The result is a unique personal narrative with the kind of inside-out point of view that professional reporters rarely capture. This footage was shot during the Gulf War. Here, the camera catches a child being taught literally to resist. These video diaries do not pretend to be balanced or objective journalism, but they do offer insights that are provocative and revealing. Diaries like these can give human rights issues more depth and dimension. The Lawyers Committee for Human Rights has launched an initiative they call WITNESS to distribute cameras to human rights monitors all around the world. So how do you get more of this powerful footage? It is hard, expensive, and dangerous for television crews to be where human rights abuses occur. The obvious solution must be to put cheap, easy-to-operate video cameras in the hands of those who are on the spot. In some countries, a camera in the right hands at the right time, at the right place, will be more powerful than tanks and guns. For years, El Salvador was a human rights horror story, but UN intervention brought the fighting to a halt. In the quiet peace that followed, a UN-sponsored truce commission was formed to assess responsibility for a decade's atrocities. In its report, the commission blames the U.S.-financed El Salvador military for 85 percent of the violations. The report has provoked a debate in both countries about the implications. We have two reports, the first from El Salvador, and then we'll pick up the story in Washington. Up in the mountains of El Mazote, archaeologists are digging up the bones of 1,000 peasants massacred by the armed forces. This massacre happened 12 years ago, at the start of the civil war between the army and the FMLN guerrillas. Although there is now peace in El Salvador, the authors of these war crimes have never been brought to trial. Rafina was a sole survivor. They said they were going to wipe us out. They were under orders to destroy everything, to kill everybody, to raise the land flat. 
Forty miles from El Mazote is the home of the last of the immediate reaction battalions, the Biris, responsible for the worst human rights violations of the decade-long war, including the El Mazote massacre. Trained by the United States, these battalions have been demobilized in compliance with the United Nations Peace Accord. Under United Nations verification, the military must reduce its 60,000 strong armed forces, purge its ranks of human rights violators, and agree to submit to civilian power. When you look at the record so far, not one person, you know, they, they haven't broke uh, the ceasefire. They haven't uh, killed anybody yet on either side, which is incredible when you, you know, when you look at Bosnia, Angola, Cambodia. But uh, now with the um, new police force, reduction in the uh, army, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Truth Commission basically gets all the dirty laundry out on the table and then you deal with that and then you just get on with it. I think it's going to be a very positive effect and, and a, a great example for Central America and certainly the world. But finding the truth in a peaceful El Salvador has turned into its own kind of war. We don't agree. We believe it's necessary to expose the army members, so in the future their actions will not be repeated. To this end, we have produced a series of commercials which the Salvadoran media has refused to air, has censored. We have particularly denounced General Orlando Cepeda. Violaciones a los derechos humanos de 1981 a 1992, 210 ejecuciones arbitrarias, 110 detenciones ilegales, 64 torturas. Ellos consideran They were offended by this. Now we are the ones who are at risk. They have threatened to arrest us, to put us in jail for six months to three years. The charge, defamation of the military. But with the power of the military hanging over his head, President Alfredo Cristiani has declared an amnesty and strenuously defends the dignity of the military. The soil of this country has been bathed by the blood of the best soldiers, fertilizing in this way the wish of the Salvadorian people to live in peace, democracy, and freedom. In the last decade, our country has been threatened by extremist ideologies. It is sad that we have to live to this, but it would be sadder if the children of our children were to live through this too, and that tomorrow they were to ask why, why we did nothing about it. When you call yourself the Truth Commission, which is a really Orwellian uh, name, you really have something to live up to, and I'm not sure they lived up to that. Elliot Abrams was Assistant Secretary for Human Rights in the first Reagan administration. There's also been a charge that the, that the United States looked the other way because it was more important to win the war than to pay attention to the details of human rights abuses. It strikes me as a crazy charge and completely refuted by the evidence of what happened in El Salvador in the 1980s. But do you feel that the United States may have sent the Salvadoran military a signal that it was okay to continue these abuses? Yeah, I don't agree with that. I think that there is an effort now to construct a mythical El Salvador where um, violence was the product of military-run death squads. And if the United States had simply put its foot down, it would have ended one fine morning. It was a desperately violent country, riven by all sorts of uh, political and social disputes. Violence came from the left as well as the right. And the United States was not in a position to just say, stop it, guys. But some congressmen now disagree. A congressional committee is now looking into what American government officials knew and when they knew about 31 human rights cases highlighted in the Truth Commission's report. This may be the last hearing on events in El Salvador. But if you served in a previous American administration and you testified before this Congress that you had no knowledge of events, that you were unaware of the killing, the torture, 
And if that proves to be a lie, you better not have said it under an oath. They include murders and atrocities like the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero in 1979, which the commission blames on longtime right-wing political leader, the late Roberto Dobison. Did we have evidence that Dobison had murdered uh, Archbishop Romero? I would say none that I ever saw. Yet there are documents like this one. Kate Doyle of the National Security Archive in Washington showed us a recently declassified cable. These two cables are both from the American Embassy in El Salvador. One is from Dean Hinton, who was then ambassador to El Salvador in 1981. And it discusses a meeting during which Roberto Dobuisson plans the murder of Archbishop Romero. During the meeting, there is described a lottery that the people who are attending the meeting hold to see who would draw the right to kill Romero himself. Another incident to be investigated, the 1981 El Mazote massacre. At the time, the U.S. Embassy claimed there was no evidence that government forces were involved. We relied on the embassy. If we received an embassy cable that said, we do not believe there was a massacre at such and such a place on such and such a day, that was the information that basically we used. First of all, there's a cable from the ambassador to El Salvador at the time. Ambassador Hinton initially claims that no evidence could be found to confirm that government forces systematically massacred civilians in the operation zone. Yet in the same cable, Hinton cites an, an elderly couple that fled the area of El Masote during the massacre, and the couple said in the interview that they had witnessed dozens of bodies uh, in the area where the massacre took place. The main point about uh, the Truth Commission in the U.S. is they did not see an investigation of the U.S. Uh, role as being their mandate. Journalist Alan Nairn covered El Salvador throughout the 1980s. Uh, the American advisors uh, worked uh, in, uh, in this office right down the hall from the clandestine uh, torture cells uh, where people were brought in, interrogated, and tortured, and, uh, and killed on a, uh, on a routine basis. While some of this information was printed, journalists like Raymond Bonner, then of the New York Times, says he encountered an active campaign to suppress and counter his reporting. The criticism changed the reporting on human rights in El Salvador. You write about uh, atrocities that uh, are going to affect American foreign policy. For example, El Salvador, when the policy was to support the Salvadoran government, Washington doesn't want to hear about human rights abuses and atrocities. Today, human rights organizations view the Truth Commission's report as a major victory, as evidence that persistence can pay off despite a decade of frustrating attempts to intervene. Our testimony at congressional hearings starting in the early 80s, none of that seemed to have made much of a dent in the U.S. and the conduct of the war here. There was pressure from Congress. There were people in Congress who were concerned about the scope of human rights abuses. But even they uh, did not make much of, a, much of a difference in the end. Why is it that you were always at odds with the human rights organizations and their reporting of well, abuses. I and Secretary of State and the President relied on the reporting of the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador, which we consider to be much more reliable than human rights groups. Organizations like Amnesty International, like America's Watch, like the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, played an absolutely crucial role in turning our policy around. I think we played a very useful role principally in being able to push harder and perhaps a bit louder at a moment where it was very difficult for people in El Salvador to raise highly sensitive issues. The report of the Truth Commission and the process that led to it is being hailed by human rights organizations as a model for how other countries can address human rights violations. We are confident that this instrument will serve many, many other areas in the world. 
The UN may be optimistic, but the battle over accountability is continuing. The Clinton administration is threatening a full aid cutoff if the Salvador government does not purge military commanders responsible for abuses. Already there's a freeze on U.S. military assistance. Next week, Charlene hunter Galt returns to Somalia, where she files a human rights update for Rights and Wrongs. Thank you for watching Rights and Wrongs. Next week, I will be in Somalia reporting from the front lines in a country where few rights are recognized. We're planning special coverage. We close our premiere with the same images with which we began, from the battlefields of El Salvador by Dutch cameraman Cornel Legrau. As his camera rolled, Legrau was shot and lay dying. He is one of many colleagues who put their lives at risk to focus attention on human rights conflicts. We honor their commitment. I'm Charlene Hunter-Galt. To order a transcript of Rights and Wrongs, Episode 1, for $5, or a video cassette for $24.95, please send a check or money order to the Global Center, Post Office Box 311, Radio City Station, New York, New York, 10101. Credit card holders call 1-800-541-2535.